Hello there, fight friends. MMA Andy Cotterell here, and welcome to the first ever episode of The MMA Show. Some of you have been watching the past little while, a month or two months, where I have every week been putting out a weekly report on Sundays slash Mondays, first on Instagram and then on YouTube. So already in a short time, it's changed. And this is just an evolution of that. I've had some really good feedback from people saying they've liked what I've put out so far, and I thought I'd expand it. Now, I really got the idea for this a long time ago, and it's it's sort of evolved. I remember when I was a little boy, I used to watch Saturday morning cartoons like a lot of you of a certain age did. Uh, but when I got older and I wasn't watching cartoons anymore, I would sit on the floor with my dog and I'd watch TSN and I'd watch different sporting events. And TSN was great. They always had these little niche sporting TV shows. Like uh, there was a fishing one with a guy, Italo Labignan, I think. It's been like 40 years since I thought of that name. So I probably got it wrong a little bit. There was also like a TSN motoring like 1995 and every year it added the year. So TSN 96, 97. Uh, I used to love those. And sometime in the past, I thought it'd be really cool to have a show like that on TSN about Canadian mixed martial arts. Now, I don't know if this is ever going to get to that point, but uh, this is a start. We're going to see how it goes. So I encourage you, please, uh, if you end up making it through the whole show and watch it, please give me some feedback. Let me know what you like, what you didn't like, if there are any particular segments you you have in mind that you'd like to see me do. So I don't know. We'll see how this can be grown together. All right. The format I kind of envision right now, and this is right now, every week it should be like this until I change my mind, but we're going to start off every show with an announcements uh, section. We're going to be talking about any Canadians that will be fighting somewhere in the world if this was just announced in the past seven days. We'll be talking about any Canadian MMA events that were announced in the past seven days, and I'll share all that with you. We will also be having everyone's favorite, a rumor mill, and this week's rumor mill is a huge one, so if you watch anything, make sure you watch that. Then we're going to be talking about what's happened in the past week, what's already happened in the past seven days. Uh, so any Canadians who fought somewhere in the world or any Canadian MMA events that happened in Canada. And of course, there were three this past week and three big ones. So let's get started. Let's get let's get grooving, guys. Uh, we're going to start off with announcements. Uh, Montreal Fight League, who just had their most recent show at the end of January, they've already announced that their next show, uh, Montreal Fight Week number 35, will be taking place on March 9th in Montreal. They've already got a half dozen fights lined up for it, and those are on the MFL page, MFL 35 page, at MMA. So if you want, please go to mix, or www.mma.ca and follow along in the upcoming events section, and we can see what we're talking about together. Next, we have uh, a few Canadian fighters who announced a fight somewhere in the world. Uh, on the 21st of February, we have uh, a guy named Phil Lozon. He'll be fighting at Throne MMA 3 in St. Michael's, North Dakota. And also uh, Isaiah Metituck will be fighting on 16th of March uh, versus Brandon Hegstad at Absolute Fight Factory in Kalispell, Montana. And he will be the main event. So that's pretty exciting. All right, those are the announcements. Now let's go on to the rumor mill. Uh, this past weekend, we had Samurai MMA 9, and there was a fighter scheduled for that event who I was talking with in negotiations, really, to do a video interview when things were on track. We were making plans for setting up a time, and all of a sudden, he ghosted me. He went silent, you know, radio silence. He was nowhere to be found, and so I didn't want to push too much. I didn't know if he was preparing and, you know, tired, or maybe he got hurt or whatever, and so I just left it at that. Well, it turns out that this fighter has been selected to be on the next edition of the UFC's The Ultimate Fighter TV show. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. It's been a while since the show has been, uh, been really in the, in the forefront in Canadian MMA anyway, but this fighter is sure to impress. He's thrilling, he's exciting to watch, and he's really talented. And that fighter is Jonathan Ramsey. Jonathan Ramsey, congratulations on making tough. I can't confirm this 100%. Because, uh, you know, nobody will confirm it to, to me 100%, but it's pretty strong rumor. I'd say it's, uh, it's something you can almost bet on. All right. So, John, good luck. All right. We are next going to be talking about what has happened in the past week. We had two Canadians who fought in the past week outside of Canada. Don't forget all the Canadians that fight inside of Canada. That'll be tracked inside their actual fight page at MMA. So outside of Canada, we had uh, Romanian slash Canadian fighter Diana Belbitsa. She had a rematch with Molly McCann at the UFC fight night in Las Vegas this past Saturday night. And unfortunately, Diana succumbed to an armbar, really nasty looking armbar uh, with a couple seconds left in the first round, I think it was. It looked like it was possibly broken. I don't I don't know. I don't have any confirmation of that, which uh, if you've ever had your arm hyperextended in an armbar, it sucks. 
and it really sucks, even when it's just painful, let alone if it, it broke. So I hope it's not broken. Uh, regardless, Diana, good luck, and, and I hope you heal well, and you'll be back stronger soon. Uh, next, we had uh, Kendall Stewart, a British Columbia fighter. She fought once in BFL a few years ago, and she moved to Thailand. I don't know if she's there full-time, but it seems like she's been there for a long time. Uh, she had her second-ever MMA fight in Thailand just a week ago, and she was victorious. For a Thai fighter, she had really good wrestling that she used to set up a takedown, take down her opponent, and submit her with a rear naked choke. Really impressive, and she's uh, just like, you know, you have in Thailand, if you don't know, they fight all the time, man. Like you can almost have as many fights as you want. It's not quite the same with MMA, especially if you take damage, but uh, Kendall says she wants to get back in there soon and maybe she'll have news for us soon. And if she does, I will let you know. All right. We had three Canadian MMA events this past week. We had Samurai MMA 9. We had Fight League Atlantic 13. And we had Champions uh, Rise MMA in Calgary. Now, this is something else different about the uh, the MMA show that is uh, something I think you're really going to like is I'm going to have guests. So we've got two guests from Samurai 9, and we've got a guest from Fight League Atlantic. From Samurai, we have Alex Morgan, who won the main event, and we have Tommy Morrison, who came back from a thrilling uh, knockdown in the first that he was looking in, in, in not very good shape, and he persevered and he won his fight. And finally, we have uh, the president of Fight League Atlantic, Derek Clark. He'll be speaking with us about the, the event this past weekend and other topics, hopefully. So this is exciting. All right. Now let's get on to the meat of the show. Let's start with Samurai MMA 9. It's a Quebec-based organization, and it's just been getting better with each and every outing. And Samurai 9 was no exception. Absolutely fantastic. Only seven fights in the card. However... It's a shame because I know the promoter Daniel Lafon had planned for a much different fight card, but it's been an epidemic lately in Canadian MMA. I don't know if it's happening elsewhere, but fights and fighters are dropping left, right, and center. So even the night of or the day of the fight, or maybe it was possibly the, the, the night of the weigh-ins before this event, they lost half of their main event. Robert Series had a serious medical condition where he had to go to the hospital. Uh, there are some rumors saying what the medical issue was, but I don't know for sure, so I'm not going to comment on it. However, he he could not fight. It was it was evident, and this was no fake. You know, sometimes fighters, you know, pull out of a fight for questionable reasons. There was no question. This was serious and severe, and so we wish Robert a speedy recovery, and I you know, hope he gets back to training and uh, the rest of his life and his fight career soon. His opponent, Kyle Prepolek, was very disappointed, of course. MMA spoke with him, and he said, it is what it is. So that's a reality these days in the fight game. I mean, you can get mad, you can get upset, but sometimes uh, it just happens. All right, uh, we're going to talk about the first fight of the night. Gino Poirier defeated Alan Gerard. This was a good, close fight. Both those guys looked good. It looked like Gino was pushing the pace a lot, and he was trying to overwhelm uh, Gerard at the start, but Gerard settled the pace down, and it went the distance, and it went to a decision. So that was a good fight. Next, we had a new Niagara top team fighter, Keenan Keller, defeated Olivier Ring. Now, uh, Keller was from originally from British Columbia he came with his girlfriend Alana Cook to Niagara top team and he's been training and putting in the putting in the mat time and he looked really good in this he's a tall lanky fighter uh, Olivia came on strong at the start of the fight he was really aggressive and really he looked really strong uh, Keenan just it seemed like he had better cardio and he just kept on going and he he used his range to, to dictate where the fight was going to go and so he won that fight it was good good look good outing for both of the guys uh, congratulations to both even at a loss you know you can congratulate somebody on a loss if they did well they did their best they tried hard and they looked good you know you can improve get back at the drawing board and and take the next fight all right, next one, Isabel Lacroix defeated Justin Preed. Now, this is incredible because I was uh, fortunate enough to be at Isabel's first two pro fights, her, both her and her husband and Tom Potosky. They used to fight for uh, Prospect Fighting Championship. And one thing I took away from her previous two fights was her really strong Muay Thai and especially her clinch. Some people forget about the clinch aspect of it. They think it's only ground and stand up. No, the clinch is in there as well. So Isabel really is able to dominate her opponents in the clinch and, and dictate where the fight goes from there. This was the, the first time 
that I saw her really face any serious adversity. Uh, she was put down. She was mounted. I don't know. Actually, I take that back. I don't know if she's mounted, but her opponent was on top, maybe side mount or something, if I remember correctly. And uh, Isabel just looked really good in the ground. She's been working hard on her grappling. It's it's vastly improved her ground submission game. And she went for submissions. She tried different things and she ended up winning the fight. It was a good fight. I think that's the type of thing that a fighter, if you have aspirations to get much better and get bigger, you really need to be challenged like that and sort of answer those questions for yourself. Like, how am I going to do if I'm not winning the whole time? How am I going to do if I meet somebody who's who's maybe a little bit stronger than me? And uh, Isabel answered those questions. Good job, Isabel. Next was, uh, it was when I first saw it, I was going to be picking it as fight of the night. And that was uh, until the Tommy Morrison fight happened. And that's the fight between Kevin Popwick Bastien. That's how you say, say his name. Kevin Popwick Bastien against Antoine Chaput. Antoine Chaput has a very high uh, grappling pedigree. And so a lot of people thought that he was going to take this to the ground and, and win that way. Kevin was having none of it. Kevin faced a lot of adversity in the first round. He got his nose busted open. There was blood everywhere. And a lot of fighters would have given in and just said, oh, fight's over. I'm done. You know, they would have been defeated. Kevin just stuck to his roots. He, he he's, uh, he's a newfound wrestler now after his time with Niagara Top Team. Uh, you know, I'm sure he had wrestling before, but it's different now. And that really helped him out. Kevin was able to just close the distance, keep Antoine close, not give him any space. He couldn't really get his grappling grappling game underway, and Kevin ended up winning the decision. Not every decision, or sorry, not every victory can be a knockout or or, or uh, an impressive submission or whatever it is. Sometimes you just got to be the guy who's standing stronger and taller at the end of the fight, and that's what Kevin did. So really good job, Kevin. Uh, next was uh, Tommy Morrison versus Jose Sandoval. And to talk about that fight, let's now bring in our special guest, Tommy Morrison. Tommy Morrison, welcome to the MMA show. Congratulations on your win. Thank you. Samurai MMA 9, it was a fantastic event from top to bottom. It was plagued with a couple issues with fights falling out. But when the fight fans came to the show to watch some fights, they sure got a fight out of you. Your fight was absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, obviously you have your battle wounds right now. You've got a big, big uh, swollen black eye. You just woke up and you've got some stitches. How do you feel? I feel pretty good. I'm really happy about the the outcome of the fight. I've rewatched the fight and I've seen I did really well. So I'm happy about that. Yeah. You know, when people like me, uh, I guess I'm what's called a pundit, right? A pundit is just somebody who talks about stuff. So when like pundits and analysts and, and people that watch the fights, they, they look at fighters and they always ask themselves questions about fighters, right? Like whether you know this or not as a fighter, in the background, all people are talking about the fight. So we ask questions about like, okay, who is this fighter? Who has he fought before? What's his record? What's his skill set? How good is he? And sometimes you never know the answers to these questions until after the fights, right? So coming into this event, you had, I think it was what, a 7-1 and one record as an amateur. You had a 5-0 and oh record as a professional. So coming into this fight, you're still pretty new in your professional MMA career. But one of the questions that hadn't really been asked of you before was, uh, or sorry, answered about you before, was how well you would deal with like strong adversity. And you yeah. did that. You answered that question in this fight. In the first round, your opponent, Jose Sandoval, well, it looked like you can tell me how it felt, but it looked like you were rocked really bad and you were wobbly and you looked like had he gone strong, maybe he could have finished you, but you just gritted out and you stuck through it and you, you finished the round and then you ultimately won the fight. Tell, tell me what you were thinking when that happened in the first round and, and what you were going through. Uh, I knew I could overcome adversity before this fight. I, I never had that big of adversity, but Personally, I, I was always sure I could, and I showed that I uh, I could also. Um, when I, I think when I got hit, all was happening through my mind was just muscle memory, honestly, because I didn't, uh, I just, uh, yeah, I don't exactly remember when it happened. So I, I watched it again, then I remembered. But uh, yeah, I think it was muscle memory and... Uh, I'm glad I trained that much because it was good muscle memory. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And something very similar happened to Kevin Popwick Bastian as well. He got really hurt in the first round and he just, you know, did what he did. You know, as a fighter, you, you train and you practice and you do the reps, right? The repetitions you do over and over and over. So your body, when you say muscle memory, your body just kind of takes over and knows what to do, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, that, I think that's what happened. Uh, I just uh, started wrestling a little bit. I clinched. Uh, I footwork. That's that's the best thing that happened on that time. Was I never stopped moving. Uh, he rocked me. I just circled around. Uh, I clinched a little bit, circled around. So I think that that's something I did real well. Well, you sure did. Going into the fight itself, um, the only thing I'd seen of you with Jose Sandoval before was the weigh-ins, where it seemed to get a little bit heated. He got a little bit too close to you, and you put your hand up to his throat. There's a beautiful photo of you you reaching up. I don't know if you're uh, you're 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 probably too young to remember this, but former Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, uh, he um, was do- going walking through a protest one time, long time ago, and a protester got too close, and so he did that. He took his hand and put it right to his throat and kind of pushed him away. And that was forever known as the Shawinigan handshake because Jean Chrétien was Shawinigan. So you kind of gave a Shawinigan handshake of your own. What were you <laughs> thinking when that happened, when he got too close? Uh, I thought about like pushing him, in a, pushing him in a way, but I just, the second I was like, ah, that's too much. So I just pushed him a little bit and it was, it wasn't a big deal in my head. It was just a, a normal waiting, you know, my, all my waiting are, Kind of uh, intense. Uh, I like to stare down opponents, and yeah, it was just a normal waiting for me. When you fight, do you? Some fighters have to look at their opponent as somebody they really dislike, that they hate almost, in order to fight them. Are you like that, or is it just a person? Uh, no, I don't. I don't hate them. I know uh, they 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 worked a lot to get where they at, and they worked a lot to get to prepare to fight against me so I respect that but at the end of the day we're in a cage and we're fighting so I mostly don't like you until the bell uh, the final bell rings when a a question I I often ask fighters it's just kind of like a fun question is would you rather win a fight in the first five or ten seconds of the fight with a KO or submission or would you rather go the whole 15 minutes or 25 minutes for a championship fight and win in the last 10 seconds? Do you have an answer to that? Um, I think the, the last, uh, the last five, 10 seconds of the fight. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be thrilling because you get um, more experience and you get to finish at the end of the fight. So that's win-win. I, I'd yeah. say it is win-win. So, you are now 6 and 0 as a professional fighter which is, is pretty awesome and it seems like uh Samurai MMA really loves you as as a competitor they bring you in the fans love you you've got a really good thing going on so what's your long term plan i know you're going to school what are you going to school for uh computer engineering at the uh, University of Concordia well i ha- i know that computer engineers can make a lot of money probably a lot more money than fighting so <laughs> what is your plan are you going to be a pro fighter or are you going to be a computer guy? Unfortunately, I decided to be a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd rather, uh, I think that's the, I want to have a plan B in case of, and, you know, anything can happen in this game. So uh, I'll have my degree in computer engineering and I'll be, I'm, I'm, but my main goal is to be UFC world champion. So I'll keep wow, being a fighter until. Yes. That's awesome. Well, already after this fight just two nights ago, or no, sorry, yeah, two nights ago, um, there's talk. I know Faber Glace of MMA Talk is saying that your fight with Jose is one of the top two fights in Samurai MMA history. It was a thrilling fight to watch. So I think you're on the right track. And, uh, you know, the fans of MMA who are watching right now uh, want to congratulate you. Thank you very much for everything you put in, all the training, all the hard work. Congratulations once again. And thank you very much for speaking with us. Thanks a lot for having me. It's my pleasure. Anytime. All right, there you go, fight friends. Tommy uh, Rambo Morrison after his really impressive uh, uh, decision victory at Samurai MMA 9. All right, next we're going to talk to the co-main event is Dayan Kaij versus Marco Elpidio. Day- I mentioned this last week's episode how I really like that Dayan Kaij is here from mostly bfl where he fights there's a really good relationship between bfl and samurai mma that i'm really appreciating and i hope you do too where there's not as much territoriality as there used to be a long time ago with fights you know if a fighter was fighting in one event the everyone say no you can't fight on my card now and it was 
kind of like backstabbing and all that kind of stuff. I never really liked it. So it was really great to see Dayon out here. Uh, it was a decision once again. Marco Elpedio came up from Mexico short notice after Kai's uh, initial opponent, Jonathan Ramsey, uh, could no longer make that fight because he was injured. Uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And uh, it was a good fight. It was uh, two professionals went at it and Dayon ended up getting the nod and he deserved the win. So congratulations, Dayon. Finally, we have Alexander Morgan versus Alexander Horshenik as the main event. And now let's bring in the chess master, Alex Morgan. Alex Morgan, welcome to the MMA show. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm well. Thank you for asking. But it, it doesn't matter how I am because what's important right now is you. You uh, were unexpectedly put in the main event of Samurai MMA 9. And you made the most of the opportunity winning your fight in dramatic fashion you must feel incredible right now yeah i'm i'm pretty happy about it uh, being the main event was good i'm i'm used to it so uh for me it doesn't doesn't change nothing i mean i was going to fight uh, the seven fight anyway there's just no fight after me so uh no i was i, I was i was ready man i fooled the place uh, people was expecting me for a, a big fight uh, i took this fight because for me it was a big fight and a dangerous fight and you know, when I take dangerous fight, I'm getting stressed. And when I'm stressed, that's where I perform the best. So that's why I took the fight, take it very seriously, uh, went in and just do what I do the best and finally mm-hmm. get a spectacular win. And I was pretty happy about that for a comeback. Spectacular is a great word for it. It was a, it was a head kick and he, he was done. Fight was over. And it was right at the start of the yeah. fight, too. So that had to feel good getting that just done and out of the way. All that nervous in your, in your nervous system, it was all gone. Yeah, exactly. What did you know about your opponent, Alexander Horshenik, before the fight? Uh, I know he was, a, he's a, he was a well-rounded MMA fighter. Uh, we watched a couple of videos. Uh, he dominates some people on the ground. He dominates on, on stand-up. He had a couple knockouts. I knew he had a lot of experience. Uh, so I knew he was he was going to be good, and he he know how to fight. You know he's he's good. Mm-hmm. I didn't let him the chance to look good, but he's a very very good fighter, talented fighter, dangerous fighter too. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, when 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 I was going to fight him, I was like, "Fuck, this is gonna be hard." But man, I'm the chess master, and I'm I'm pretty sure. I was telling myself, "I'm the chess master. I'm gonna find something I can." Uh, can find a hole in his game and I will uh, I will use it to 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 destroy him and uh, finally uh I found this uh this uh, little hole in the game and I land the head kick some people mm-hmm. say I was lucky uh, but I I I I'm going to tell you right now it was all uh it was all uh prepared I I saw mm-hmm. it uh, I it was a good read I read the, his his head movement I saw this and uh, then land the head kick uh, and uh, th- yeah I'm 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 going to do a, a video of, uh, about it this week to uh, break it down a little bit. Oh, I can hardly wait to watch that. That, that always interests me how fighters and their, and their coach, coaching team are able to decipher an enemy and figure out how to, to counter them. So it was beautiful on your part. That was fantastic. Thank you. So, yeah, I got the best coach, man. Uh, you know, Firaz, uh, TriStar, uh, Donald, Donald Wimet, uh, ex-TKO uh, champion. I'm well surrounded by good people, good training partner. Uh, I, I can't ask better, man, for, for real. Uh, I'm always well prepared. I have everything I need uh, in my camp to be able to to prepare for big fights, even bigger fights. Uh, I hope it's going to come. And uh, yeah, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, happy about that. When this fight was announced, when your opponent was named as Alexander, a lot of people in the MMA fight community were going, who? Who's this guy? And they weren't really sure what to think, or maybe they thought he was just some guy brought in to lose. But I, in a pure, few, a pure fluke, unexpectedly, uh, during Christmas, I was in Alberta visiting my sister for Christmas and her boys. And while I was there, I asked Brian Bird, the coach of Champions Creed, if I could stop by a training session just to watch. So I was there during a sparring day, and Alexander was there, and he was training. So I'd never heard him before. I asked a few questions. I said, who's this guy? And I was told he's a fighter from the Ukraine who's been in Canada for a while now. And let me tell you, Alex, when I was watching all the professional fighters in that room, Alexander was pro- probably the most impressive fighter in there. He was, uh, there were a couple of excellent fighters in there, Josh Fox, uh, Mac Larson, and, uh, oh, I don't remember his name, but it'll come to me. But Alexander was just from one opponent to the next opponent and he was looking really good, and he didn't seem to get tired. He had a great cardio. So 
when this fight was announced, I even said in one of my videos, I said, you know, this is going to be a closer fight than some of you might think because Alexander, no, he's not a nobody. Yeah. So the fact that you dispatched him so quickly and so impressively, I mean, that just, I, I, I held you in high regard before, but you just went up a level in my book because, you know, it's air quote easy to beat a scrub. It's, it's easy to beat a crappy exactly. fighter, but to beat somebody at that level and so impressively, that's, that's really impressive. And you know, that, that's, that's what I, I say to people. Like I didn't give him the chance to look good against me. Uh, one of my strengths is that even if the guy's good, I always going to make him look bad. You know, anybody in front of me, even if the guy is a fucking superstar, I'm going to make him look get bad. Even if he beat me, I'm going to make him look get, look bad. So that's one of my strengths. And uh, people don't understand how good this guy is. Mm -hmm. And beating a guy like 18 wins, six losses that way, what else can I do more to get in the UFC? You know, what, what else? Like, is there really somebody that will want to fight me in Samurai? Like, that's going to worth it, you know? Yeah. I mean... I mean, I, I I don't know what to do more to prove that I deserve to be in the big league since so long. I know I had my mm -hmm. opportunity at Contender Series. I fucked up because I was stressed. You know, it's, it's a different vibe. But man, if you give me a fight in the UFC anywhere, I'm going to be ready, man. I, I mean, I took this fight. I prepared for this fight. I was ready for this fight. And you can see it, it went very well. I can do this to anybody in the world. I'm pretty sure. I'm, I, I, and I know it. And that's why I was so happy about it. It's like I had the, 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 the opportunity to show people who I am, like who I know I am. You know, I, I, I know who I am. I know this is me. This, this was the, the real fucking chess master. This is what I'm able to do. And this is what I can do to anybody in the world. And I believe in myself. And that's the most important thing. Even if people let down on me, I, I, I don't care because I know inside of me that I have what it takes to be in this big league and to perform. Being in the big league is something, but like perform at that level, I know I can do it, man. I'm ready for it. You know, I have 20 pro fights in MMA, uh, one pro fight in boxing, pro fight in Muay Thai. I got the experience, man. I'm 32 years old. I mean, I'm getting my prime. I'm ready for it, man. I don't know for real, I don't know what's next for me. I don't know what else I need to do to prove that I dis that I belong mm -hmm. in the big league. But we'll see, man. I will see. I I'm just gonna be patient at this point. Take a step off and just you know focus on my gym and wait for a big opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna read something to you that you, you posted uh, very recently. I'm just gonna read an excerpt, so just a part of it. It says, "A performance of a lifetime. I had a fearful, experienced, and dangerous opponent in front of me." Throughout the fight, I was able to stay calm, follow my game plan while maintaining a solid defense, while maintaining a solid defense, sorry, I repeated, that made sure my opponent wasn't able to touch me once. This training yes. camp has been extremely stressful, and I've put a lot of pressure on myself to be able to perform. This training camp was definitely a con continuation of a journey where we worked together to up my MMA game. It's been a long process filled with small tweaks, but I finally feel like the puzzle, all the puzzle pieces we've been building for years together are coming together nicely. Yes. Some people, when they, they watch fights, they only watch the fights, right? So they'll tune into a, to a fight event, a UFC or something. They'll put it on the TV. And from the start to the end, and that's it. It's, it's over for them. But for the athletes, this is your life. You, you're you're a, a head coach at one of the TriStar gyms in Riviera Noor. So you're always training every single day, I, I bet. I bet you don't even take a day off. You're either training yourself or you're training other people. And when you're not training, you're probably thinking about fighting. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So this is something that, you know, fighters are people. So you've got hopes, you've got fears, you have everything else that everyone else has with regards to your career in the fight game. You mentioned briefly why this one was so special for you. What was the most fearful thing about going into this fight for you? Not to be able to perform as I, I'm able to, you know. I, I want it so bad to show to people, like I said, that who I am, like who's the chess master. I was scared to to lose in front of my people. I'm not scared of getting hurt. I'm not scared of getting hit. Mm -hmm. I'm scared to lose because when I lose, it's it's like I know I know people don't see it like that, but me, I see it like I let people down. There's so many people that believe in me. 
having my own gym, you know, that means I have a lot of people. If you went to La Teu this weekend uh, to see my fight, dude, I sell the place, man. Uh, I'm the, I, I, put, I put ass on seats. And, and everybody I heard you sold a lot you of tickets. Ask, yeah, you, you can ask anybody, man. The chess master put ass on seats. That's, that's all matters. People come to see me. People like to see me fight. People like me as a fighter, but I believe they like who I am too. You know, my gym is going pretty well right now. I have a lot of members, a lot of people, different people. People do it recreational. People do it for competition, you know. And I, I treat everybody equal. And I believe this is one of the secrets is like, yes, I'm an animal in the cage. I, I want to perform. I want to kill people in the cage. But man, I'm a good human being. And and I I, I want to prove to people like around around me that yes me i do it through fighting but everything in life you want to do you can overcome that's what i want to tell people that's what i want to show people you know even if i lose my last fight i was like yeah i lose my last fight for sure the guy was uh uh one um category over you know his bigger guy is not my weight lost in a close decision but yo guys you know what i just bounce back i come back i fight in my weight division against a top opponent fucking knock him out that's how it works, guys. You know, that's that's what I I want people to know. And um, yeah, you mentioned it. Having a gym is is pretty good for me. You know why? Because see, it's Sunday. Sunday is sparring. I just come back from sparring. You know, and I put the gloves on for the the boxing coach. Our boxing coach is going to fight, so I put the gloves on with the, with my coach. Uh, it was good. It's good. I like to spar, man. I like it's my happy place. I like to be there. Uh, when I when I'm not. Uh, training I've trained people and when I train people you know it's for me it's like a a, a workout because I train mentally my brain I I explain movement and technique and it go like to my brain and uh, I, I I keep repeating this you know I sorry for my English man I try to explain the more I can uh, but uh, you know it's always it's always in my head and I think and I think and it make me think to other thing and new techniques so I can ask Faraz or, or Donald, you know, I, what you do with this technique, this technique. So, so for me, it's mental training, and it's the best thing I can I can have. You know, the gym. It's uh, may, I can live from my passion. I can stay in the gym. I have fun. You know, my life is good, man. Uh, even when I lose fight, my life is good. I like it. I like my people around me. I'm surrounded by good people, and uh, yeah, the, the, that's it. Well, it sounds like you've you've got a really good life. Yeah, I, I like I like, I like uh, I'm a happy I'm a happy guy you know I'm a happy guy. Uh, just winning fights is just the it's just the cream of the cream you know it's it's, a, it's a, some gravy. I'm pretty happy because I put so much so much time in it. But uh, I, I like what I do, man. You know, I'm I'm a martial artist. I'm a fighter. I like fights. I like uh, I like help people. I like uh, I like to be in the gym. Uh, for me, it's great. It's uh, grateful for me you know uh, to help people is good i know I, I i'm here yes yes i'm a coach but i'm more than a coach i'm uh, i'm somebody to look at for a lot of people and you know you ask me one of my fear it's i don't want to disappoint them mm -hmm. you know well alex it was a fantastic fight it was thrilling to watch I, I don't like asking the question that some reporters do when they ask right away, like, what's next? What are you going to do? I'm sure you really have no idea yet. It's going to take some time. You'll sit down with your coaches and your team and you'll figure it out. What's what your future is going to look like, regardless of what happens. I'm confident you're going to do well and you're going to excel at whatever it is you, you challenge. So congratulations once again. Is there anything you'd like to say before we go? I just want to say thank you to all the fans, uh, all my sponsors that uh, are with me. Uh, guys, uh, thank you to to to, to everybody. Uh, for support me and uh, thanks to you too to uh, receive me uh, in the podcast uh, guys uh, have to follow this guy he's, he's doing a great job so uh, thank you to everybody thanks for supporting me and uh, I love you guys I'm sure he is just thrilled with the result uh, coming off a loss so it's always good to get a win back in the column and he's right I mean what can he do next I mean it's clear that he's one of the top small handful of fighters in Canada and I would love to see him get a chance in the UFC or PFL Bellator or one or anywhere. So we'll see how that goes. Our next guest, as I mentioned before, is a president of Fight League Atlantic, Derek Clark. Derek Clark, welcome to the MMA show. Thanks very much for having us, Andy. 
Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm really uh, thankful that I get to speak to you because you have just, since well, you and Fight League Atlantic, your promotion, your mixed martial arts promotion, since you've come onto the scene, you've just very slowly and steadily uh, been climbing that hill, man, and your promotion is absolutely fantastic now. It was, it was, it was really good before, but you're reaching whole new levels now. Fresh off a, a pretty successful weekend, I'd say, Fight League Atlantic 13. Just give me your overall thoughts on the event and how it went. Sure. Uh, again, thanks very much for the platform, Andy. We very much appreciate what you do in Canada. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not an easy job covering mixed martial arts. So appreciate yourself and, and all the other guys and girls who can thank cover you. the sport. Um, from, on behalf of John and I, we want to thank everybody who does show up, support our events, our sponsors, athletes, teams, coaches, everybody involved, our staff, first of all, um, an incredibly successful, successful weekend. Obviously we lost our main event uh, with Christian Salvo, Christian Tremaine. You know, not a lot of happy customers when it comes to that. Not a happy main event when you have Christian Savoy working, working so hard to, to get that opportunity. And, and you got to, you know, show some love to Christian Tremaine, too. The guy's not a quitter. And these things happen sometimes in combat sports. But overall, like stepping up, Drake Farrell came in and put on a great performance. Uh, so did Marco Rubio in, in the main event and, and all the fighters in general. Just a, a fantastic event with a lot of action. And that's what we, we really focus on out here. Exciting fights. Like, I can put 15 pro fights on a card all day long. No problem. But it's got to be the right fight that's exciting, and the fans have to really be excited to want to come back. I've talked about this a few times recently, that fight promotions, when they get introduced into a, to a geographic area, they have different models they can follow. And Fight League Atlantic took the uh, viewpoint of starting off grassroots. So you brought in a lot of new fighters, guys who had never fought before. In the early days, there were O&O fighters fighting O&O fighters. And slowly over time, those fighters got, you know, one victory, two victory, three victories. They were amateur when they started. They moved on to professional. I think that's a really smart way to do it, man. Like, not only are you bringing in the local fighters, you're going to bring in the local eyeballs and ticket sales, but these guys are getting a ton of experience, and you've got a bunch of guys who are loyal to the promotion, guys and girls who are lo loyal to the promotion. Where did you get that idea from to to run your show this way? You know what? It's it's kind of how it started back when uh, I was doing submission series promotions. That's how it all started. We started in 2014 doing jujitsu shows. That was we were. And no one knows this, but we were before Flow Grappling. Flow Grappling tried to come out and buy us after our first show, uh, mm -hmm. submission series. That, yeah, the, you know, the like lock and finish. It was called. AJ mm -hmm. Asgram uh, contacted us. He was looking to buy us, and and it just didn't work out. Uh, they weren't exactly polite to deal with. So shout out to him. He was an asshole. Um, but yeah, it's it's always kind of been that way, you know, local, local, local. We haven't had that opportunity out here in the East coast. And you look at our jujitsu scene out here now, it's huge. And that's why, yeah. because you give people opportunities, you have to stay consistent, do what you say you're going to do and give people opportunities and, and they'll flourish and look at us now. And I always say it out here. It's, 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 yeah, ticket sales are one thing, but if it's like the old movie, you know, if you build it, they will come. And that's kind mm -hmm. of what I've always been. Same as John, like, John, you know, John, like John refereed my first jujitsu tournament that I wow. competed in. And it was him and I always talk about this because John, he was very much involved heavily in the scene before I got involved tournament, uh, doing tournaments and just being involved that way. And uh, when we started doing events, him and I kind of got along and always like in a really polite and happy, non-confrontational, non-competitive way. We wanted to work together to make the scene better and for everybody else. And uh, anyway, he wrapped my first jujitsu scene and, and I was kind of in the middle of the match. He's like, I like your style, man. And I was like, I like your style. And then we <laughs> ended up being good buddies after that. And, and that's, yeah, so that's kind of where it all came from. That's what it's about is just giving back to what we never had growing up, right? And we say it a lot, but yeah. So you guys almost had like a stepbrothers moment where you were like, do we just become best friends? You know, like that's, that's a big thing out here, Andy, is like, we're, we're all friends out here. Like it's, it's a different promotion, I think that, and I've seen interviews with you in the past, other people talking and saying like, I come from a long, 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 long customer service background of taking seniors on tours around the world by myself to luxury vacations. And I worked for Disney for 10 years. It's about customer wow. service. These are fighters at one point, but they're also, they're customers. So it's, you know, you have to treat these people with the respect that they deserve. And, and that's, that's giving them something that they never had before, you know, so. 
I, I'm not saying this just to shine you on, but I have never heard one single person say any one single bad thing about Fight, Le- Le- sorry, Fight League Atlantic or Derek Clark. It's Everybody loves you. The fighters especially feel like they're really well taken care of. It feels like they're heard when they bring up concerns and things like that. So I think, you know, you're creating your own legacy, right? Like we all do. The, the way I've heard it said uh, that people don't remember every interaction they have with us, but they remember the way that that we make them feel and everybody feels like they love Derek Clark and fight league Atlantic. So that's got to feel pretty great. That kind of gave me shivers a little bit, Andy, to be honest, man, Uh, because a lot of times John and I in this business deal with so much negative. Like, as you know, you've been involved in the sport for a long time. It can really weigh you down. Um, You know, like just some of the emails you get and the negativity that people really come, come at you with can really be hard. Um, And it's hard to notice the happiness or the positivity. Like we just, we're just ourselves and, and there's no fakeness about it. And, and that's the way it should be. And that's very kind of you to say, and very kind of, you know, we get into it with athletes, you know, it, it happens all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a passionate, high intensity sport. There's a lot going on. There's two shows running at once. It's not every, uh, not every event, not every interaction is just going to be about cupcakes. It's sometimes there's hard conversations and uh, intense conversations, but like you just said, it's, it's about, you know, doing things the right way. And, and hopefully in the end, we get the respect from people. And, and that's, that's like you said, that's what matters. You know, we yeah, can all do these sure. events and it's, you know, having this legacy, but like you say, a legacy of being kind is, is the key for sure. Another thing I really like about Fight League Atlantic, and this is a selfish <clears throat> perspective from somebody who covers the sport. As you know, my website, MMA.ca, I've got an upcoming event section where I list all the fights in Canada. And oftentimes an event will be finished, uh, some promotion somewhere in Canada. And, you know, that's it. I, I won't know of another one until it's almost approaching or, you know, they'll give me a, a month's notice or I'll, I'll hear kind of rumors there's a fight happening. Fight League Atlantic, man, you've got a plan laid out. Even on your Instagram, you have like all the dates that show FLA 13, FLA 14, FLA 15. Lots of advance, I think almost like a year in advance. That seems like you're really well organized. And and how much of a of, of a business, I know... It's, this is a business for you. It's a passion, but it's also a business. How much of a business is this for you? And what's your long-term goals with the, with the organization? Well, that's, uh, again, um, organization is key for us. Like uh, John, you know, John owns three or four different businesses. I'm heavily involved. Like this is my full daytime job, 12 hours a day, pretty much. I'm on my phone running this business and John's on the back end supporting me doing everything else. He doesn't, he's not out in the front as much, but he's handling a lot of stuff in the back end. We have a big, big team and we've been doing it. Like I've been doing this since 2014. We, our first event that we did submission series pro was, mm-hmm. was uh, January 15th, 2024 or 2014. Sorry. So we just passed the 10 year mark of when we started this Danny who runs wow. our shows um who's streaming he started streaming on his own he we bought the equipment slowly every event we kept putting more into it and learning on our own and that's how we became the way we are just like you said slow you know putting everything back into the business and and growing slow and being organized I, i think that's a big thing about being organized so athletes people like yourself people can plan if you don't know when a fight is going to happen then it's like how do i plan my year out at all so you know, it's, I think other promotions use that a little bit as an advantage. They try to do that a little bit of, you know, so other people don't know, but like, I'm a big proponent. Like I have a great relationship. I try to get along great. Like uh, with Daniel from Samurai, great relationship. I have a great relationship mm-hmm. with Jay from BFL, a great relationship with Sonny at Unified. And that's how it should be. Like we're a small country with a small group of athletes. At the end of the day, everybody's trying to get to the next level. So we got to all mm-hmm. stop competing against one another and realize we're all trying to get each other to our level, but the UFC is where everybody wants to go or risen or wherever they want to go. So the more we can work together, the better it is for our country. It's funny how attitudes have changed because when I first got in the sport locally, anyway, in the Maritimes, there were several MMA promotions and, and different gyms and they wouldn't let their fighters fight in one other promotions fight card and vice versa and stuff like that. And everywhere these days, like you mentioned, uh, Samurai and BFL, uh, when I went to Durham Fight Series uh, last year for the first ever event, they had the Durham Durham Fight Series guy, they had Woody from BTC, and they had Jamie from yeah. uh, Prospect all hanging out together. Uh, I think I saw you at the one of the Sam- Samurai Six, I saw you and John, or maybe just you. Um, so it's wonderful. I love it. Absolutely love it that you guys are getting together 
And it's like, it's, I don't know if one big happy family is the right phrase, but you guys are all have a, having a common goal. You're working towards MMA getting big in Canada and just doing well and letting the fighters fight. Exactly. And and that's the way it should be. We went up to Unify when we were up at the UFC. We went and bought tickets and check out and support Sonny and, yep. and Rob and that show too. And if you're a fight fan, you're a fight fan and everyone needs to leave the bullshit to the side, especially, and that's where I like, I struggled in this band coming up in this sport, like originally doing this. I had a lot of bad shit locally said about me and calling the commission on me and people cutting my throat. Like, man, come on. Like it's, it's foolish, but it's all ego based, right? Like that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. and, and when people see something that somebody does better, they get jealous. And instead of using that as fuel to fire you and you get better on your end, they just continue to talk shit and use it as a scapegoat. Yeah. But, and like the, that's the way it should be. We all got to get along. And, like you said, it doesn't have to be one happy family, but at least there has to be that mutual respect of like, hey, like I can't get my fighter a fight. They're under contract with me. You make that phone call and say, hey, can I get him a fight with your brand? So it helps out both organizations so they can have a full card and, and it keeps athletes busy, which in the end helps our sport grow, period. Absolutely. When athletes, Absolutely. like what just happened this weekend with Christian Savoy again for the second time, like – it's it's hard it's hard on the poor guy it's hard on athletes you know so you know it's funny when i was speaking with christian i interviewed him a few weeks ago in preparation for this main event and we even talked about it it's, it's on the video i posted on youtube where i said it looks like this show is going on i just talked to christian tremaine yesterday he's good to go you're good to go let's just hope this fight happens yeah. and we both said yeah knock on wood this fight happens and we kind of laughed and I remember I had, uh, I, I like being organized as well. So I pre plan my videos, my content to be posted. It's already saved as drafts. So I woke up Saturday morning or sorry, Friday morning, whatever the morning was of your event. I had all my Christian uh, Savoie stuff saved, uh, my Instagram post, and I just woke up. I sort of, my eyes were still bleary, and I just opened up my Instagram and pressed, went to my drafts and pressed send. And then you messaged me almost right away saying, man, this fight's off. I'm like, what happened? This fight's off so quickly. I can't even yeah. imagine how I know Christian Tremaine feels terrible, terribly, but there's a lesson Big for him then too. Like, I, I don't know his hundred percent history, but you know, at this level, you can't, you can't miss weight. It used to be years ago that if you missed weight, man, you were pariah, you were done. And yeah. people would think twice about bringing you in even at all. And it seems yeah. like people are missing weight left, right, and center these days. And I, I'm not trying to disrespect him. I, you know, I, I feel terribly for him. I know it wasn't easy and he, he really tried and that's why he went into what was a kidney failure. But yeah. I mean, at this level, especially if you're a main event, you need to be professional at this man. You need to plan. You need to get a nutritionist. You can't be cutting 30 pounds overnight. Like maybe they do in the UFC where they have like uh, the IVs to, to rehydrate and all that stuff. You need, you need to be ready. And I agree. For, for, yeah, for, for Christian Savoie, I mean, what's to say? I'm, I mean, these guys, they put in weeks and months of preparation. In fact, we talked, Christian Savoie and I talked about this, where it's more, it's more than just the preparation for this fight, right? Because these guys are professionals. This is what they do yeah. for a living. And so the one thing they can't get back is their time, their life. This is yeah. like three months, four months that... I'm not going to say it's wasted because you're still training, you're still improving your skill set, but that that flow where you're working on bringing your career from here to here, that time is wasted. Yeah. It's it's gone. And so I can't even imagine how terribly he must feel. Yeah, yeah I got to give a lot of respect to to Christian Savo and how he handled this phone call. Those are no never phone calls that uh, John and I either like to make. Uh, it's it's horrible. It's the worst part of this business for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But he handled it like a, you know, I, I told Christian on the phone, I said, I'm like, I almost cried, broke into tears when I called him and yeah. told him because it's, you know, what goes into this for these kids. And, and he's on the cusp of great, doing great things that he's worked a long, long time to get there for. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other hand, you feel bad for Tremaine. Like he's a wonderful kid, you know, these things yeah. happen, but um, you know, I always say in this business, it's, it's, there's three things that uh, hold a fighter back from making it, to the event and it's travel for well first medicals travel weigh in mm -hmm. those three things and i always tell people that's why it says everything on our events card subjects change no refund policy and some people don't understand yeah. that it's fine but that's how it is in combat sports or, or it is in any sport like i always use this as an example it's you know for people it's if you go to a maple leaf scheme and mitch mariner's not playing do they give you a refund no they don't it's yeah it's part of live sports unfortunately and Combat sports just takes it a whole different 
level. There's mm-hmm. so many hoops that they have to get through and process just to get to that cage. And but it's going back to that. Like I wouldn't, ne- I wouldn't offer Tremaine a fight at 170 again. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's just you know, same as Dorian Dokai. I would never offer him yeah. a fight at 185. The amount of money John and I have put on the line and has gone out the door from wasted flights and fights since the last year is ridiculous. And MMA, like you said, it's happening more and more and more. No one's making weight, and the only people who are losing is the promoter. No one talks about that. The other fighter, obviously, yeah. too. But the promoter, it's losing big time. And it's it needs to stop, like because technically in the contract we could come back, but no one does because that's just not how it is, right? But yeah, you know, make make the weight, like yep, yep. It's 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 frustrating right. for sure. Well, let's move on to some uh, some happy happy discussion. Let's talk about Fight yeah. the Atlantic Thirteen. You had a bunch of great fights in the card, and I'm just going to run through some notes I took from the event, and we can maybe talk about some of the fights and get your perspective. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the first fight of the night, let me just go to my notes here, was I Brett Smith defeated Damien Sentner, unanimous decision. Uh, my notes were just a good fight. It was a good fight. Went to it. Went to the end. Both brand new guys. You could tell, but they looked like they were doing okay. Um, they were uh, uh, very clearly new fighters, and you can tell they learned a lot. It's one of those things, right? Like everyone thinks they can be a fighter. I'm not talking about these guys. I'm talking about people in general. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so, and even these guys, I'm sure they've been training for a while. But it's exciting to know they had their first ever experience, and they finally get to go now. Oh wow, that's what it's like to be a fighter. Because in the gym, in the gym, you know, you, you're you're invincible. You're doing great. You feel good on yourself, and then you get into a cage against somebody who's not your training partner. He's not your friend. He's not going to go easy on you. He's trying to trying to win the fight too. And so, yeah. you know, that was that, that was what I took out of that fight. It was a good fight though. Agreed. I, they're very well said. That's exactly, you know, two young guys who, a couple, both them, the backstory between those guys, they've, they've competed each other in grappling, local grappling tournaments like four or five times. So it's a funny matchup because they knew each other so well. They've competed each other against, against each other so much, but never in a fight. So I was interested to see what would happen between the two. And they, and they both showed up. It was a great grueling fight between two big kids and like you said, it was, you know, it's there's why the certain cards are built a certain way. And, and I always say the first fight on a card is, is just as important as a main event. Sure. Um, very sets much the like tone. the UFC does. Sets the tone, right? And, and that's why that fight was, was first. Awesome. Okay, we'll go on to uh, Matt Swan defeated Cody O'Halloran. Now, when I posted yeah. my results for FLA 13, I gave a, a certain fight a fight of the night, and somebody commented that this should have been the fight of the night. I agree. It was an excellent fight. Uh, yeah. what, what are your thoughts on that fight? It was a phenomenal fight. That's exactly what fans want to see. You know, mm-hmm. like, they, and that's what amateur fights really bring. Like, there's no yeah. hold yeah. up. There's no hesitation, right? Like, they're going for it. And, man, like, what an exciting fight from both those guys. There was everything you want in a fight. You know, they finished with a submission. They both dropped one another, and it was awesome. Yeah, great, yeah, great, great good. fight. I, I, I've been in the middle of dealing with this snow, so I haven't had a chance to, to think about the fight tonight at all. But I would say, like, just I'm just trying to think right off the top of my head. Like, it was, yeah, it was one of the top ones for sure. Great awesome. performance. Okay. Two guys who are over six feet tall that are fighting at 140 pounds. Crazy. Oh, I didn't realize they were that tall. Holy moly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're not going to talk about Big every boy. fight, but uh, we're going to go on to Chris Rotul. Great debut, really strong is what I put down. I remember that he won his fight. Uh, he looked really good. And that's one of those things where you never really get an appreciation of, of how good a fighter is when a fight's over pretty much that quickly. Sure, it's impressive. Sure, it's great. But there's still a lot of questions to be answered about this fighter. Like, you need to see him face some adversity but uh, to, yeah. to, to really know, you know what he's got. But he looked really impressive, and it was a good start as far as I'm concerned. He did, and, and it's funny because that guy's like he's a super high level wrestler, like almost made the Olympics, mm-hmm. like very good wrestler. And he always says, "He's like, no, I'm fighting this fight on the feet." And you know, he certainly did. He he put mm-hmm. out a top prospect in Ben Lee's. You know, Ben has had the Maritimes on hold here the last couple of months, just being a little bit of a star. And 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 I think that was a great fight for both of them. You know, it's that's again what the amateur ranks are about. Um, and Chris showed a great game plan, came out, overwhelmed Ben and, uh, super humble in defeat too, so, or mm-hmm. in, in the, in the victory. So yep. yeah, great I fight for both that. guys. Hunter Savage said 
Chad Cox, his coach, taught him how to be humble and how to love himself. And this is something that that people involved in martial arts in general know and understand is that sometimes a martial arts environment uh, can be life changing, literally life life changing. For some people, it can show you the first bits of of positive human interaction. You can have parental figures. You can have as a coach, a, a good coach can be there for you in life, can really teach you how to be a person, a yeah. good person, not just a good fighter. And so when I heard those comments, it just made me all nice and warm inside, and I loved it. I agree. That that That's a big thing that, like, I really try to, again, I come from, like, a customer service Disney background. And, yeah, you know, like, guys in this community, some of them be like, oh, you're a pussy, blah, 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 blah. Like, good, man, that's fine. I don't care. I'm very confident in my own skin and comfortable in the man I am. And that's just the way that I believe our athletes should be like, and Chad Cox is a very similar mindset. The chainsaw, a great guy and being humble. Like there's a guy who's put a ton on of miles on his body. He's done a lot for this community out here. Um, and I love seeing him find success in, in, in that gym. He's a great guy, a great part of this promotion. And, and that's the way you, not everybody, you know, I'm not the bot by any means. Not everybody has to be humble, mm-hmm. but. Uh, it's a wonderful thing when you see a kid that young come off of such a great finish, be that composed. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Let's move on to what I said was a fight of the night. Dylan Shepard defeated Devin Turner with a unanimous decision. What were your thoughts on that? Were you able to, are you able to watch every fight when it's happening or are you busy doing promoter stuff in the back? No, uh, John and I actually sit cage side. Uh, so a lot of people probably don't know this. They probably see me on my phone the whole time. I'm dealing with pay-per-view issues or I'm dealing with whatever, uh, throughout the whole time when they're, when they're having issues, I'm the one that's dealing with it because we just don't have a customer service department yet. But then I'm also the one who's posting the winners. So uh, I'll run back, you know, Hey, great job. Great fight. Post the winner. Then I got to go on Facebook, delete the win. Like there's a whole process that has to happen. Sure, so there's yeah. a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, but I do for the most part, get to watch some fights, some events. It depends what happens. You know, sometimes you're out back, sometimes you're whatever you're doing, uh, deal, putting out a fire, but this event, um, it was great. I was able to watch a lot of the fights and that was one that I really wanted to catch. Um, uh, I have a lot of respect for both of those kids, both of them, um, come from different kind of walks of life um but both very similar kids and uh just humble humble uh in gracious in defeat Devin turner was he put on a great fight uh didn't fight the fight that he wanted to fight but you know he ran into dylan shepherd who was in my opinion one of the smartest fighters on our entire roster uh the kid's a very very talented fighter great fight iq and, and just getting better um wasn't the most exciting fight i don't think for uh what they thought like obviously they were probably dylan was probably trying to get the finish and and same with uh devin trying to keep it standing up but that's a championship fight and and dylan fought a smart fight to to take home the second uh belt and and i loved seeing an amateur defend the belt because we haven't seen that yet Uh, everyone's gone pro which is understandable too but uh, in my opinion it's great to get that experience get another belt and then move on yep one of the things that people might not realize is that sure a, a knockout's exciting sure a, a submission can be thrilling to watch when it happens <clears throat> yeah. but sometimes when you get two fighters who are very close you're not going to have huge advantages right it's a game of maybe it's not a game of inches like in football but it's a game of millimeters right like you yeah. you, you, you juke left and and you know you miss a strike that could have knocked you out and you know small little increments like that mean all the difference and when those two guys are so evenly matched i'm sitting on the edge of my seat watching fights like that i love it Exactly. Like that, that kind of fight could have changed hands very quickly. Like, mm-hmm. you know, D- Dylan was doing well the first two rounds. Devin came back a little bit in the third and fourth and, and, and Dylan turned it on the fifth. And, but there was some, you know, there was great grappling exchanges and it was, and it was exciting for my end to start to finish. So. Okay. Let's move on now to the main event. Drake Farrell defeated Marco Rubio, Antonio Aguilar, TKO punches from the back mount, 237 round two. That was a good fight. Drake Farrell, I, I confess, I didn't really know too much about him. So when you mentioned to me on the on the day of the fight that he was being brought up for the main event, I did a quick little research, and he's a, he's a good-looking kid. He looks promising. He's got some good talent. Very much so. He's a, a kid who's been competing for us since he, he, like he competed, I think, in my second-ever grappling show. And he, he's a guy who trained with Ken Peters down in Cape Breton and then made the yep. move to the mainland. Now he's with uh, he was with TJ and um, he was training with us a little bit and picked a kind of jujitsu on his way to Halifax. He's made all the stops at Marmac and Truro, and then he finally found his home with uh, with Gavin at Tower One and the team there. So 
he's a stud of a kid, uh, another young, hum, humble, wonderful kid. Uh, I love the guy. I think he might be like, he's a red seal already. He's got his education taken care of and, uh, and he works full time down the shipyard there and, and does this as well. So he's a, he's a great kid, great family who's uh, supported him all the way. And, uh, and, a uh, shout out to Marco as well for doing, uh, Oh, oh you're still there. Yep. Yep. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, shout out for right. uh, Marco. Fantastic fight. Not a fight that a lot of people are wanting to jump in there to take. So yep. great for him. Stepped up and uh, he was bringing it. He was fighting the whole time. And uh, again, it's uh, we'll see what happens with him. He's another guy we're going to bring back very soon. And uh, yeah, you'll see lots of money. Awesome. Good to hear. All right, Derek. Uh, before we get going, maybe you could just give us a sneak peek. Do you have any plans or any big news you can share about Fight League Atlantic 14 and maybe a main event? Or do you have any fighters in mind that you know are going to be on the card already? You can give us a bit of a sneak peek. Sure, yeah. Uh, we we do have uh, we have about five or six fights lined up for that card. We're getting all of our media out from this card here in the next seven days or so. Seven to ten days usually is what it takes for us to get all of our media out. Um, and then we'll start dropping these fights um nothing on a main event yet we do have uh one that we're looking at um very much you very well might see christian sabwa be the main event of this mm. card as well um you know this kid again he's been through the rough yeah. in the ring and uh you don't want to leave christian on the shelf so long so if if we can find him the right fight which is our plan uh he will be the main event at fla 14 as well awesome um Good. So, so yeah we'll, we'll see what happens uh, we have a couple other great fights in there. We're not going to announce just yet, but we we do have the Kumite uh, scheduled for Friday night, um, which is uh, a grappling show. Which uh, we have uh, an eight uh, female bracket, a sixteen male bracket, and then uh, who knows uh, who you'll see in the main event. There we got a high level guy that we're looking to bring in the, the main event. Um, but yeah, you'll definitely in FLA fourteen. You're going to see some 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 very familiar names uh from the community uh guys who've been around for quite a long time and, and deserve the shine so uh, happy to have them back and, and then we're going to move into fla 15 our first fight uh card in halifax uh, the halifax regional municipality darkness sportsbook super excited about that and we have a huge main event lined up for that fight that uh we'll we'll talk to you about in the next Ooh. couple couple months once once we get it finalized i'll, I'll pass it over to you Awesome. That's good to hear. I, I love it. I'm really happy for success, Derek. Congratulations on everything. Um, I don't have anything else to ask thank right you. now at this point. I just want to thank you for being a part of the first ever MMA show. I don't know where this is going to go yet, but maybe it'll be uh, something bigger and better someday, like like Fight League Atlantic. It'll grow slowly and get to be where it is now. Uh, so thanks a lot. I appreciate you, Derek. 100% and very honored to be on the first episode, Andy. You've done a lot for the, the sport in our country, and a lot of you guys don't get the recognition that you deserve. Um, you know, it's it's an, uh, a thing that a lot of time, you know, it's it's not a high-paying thing. It's it's not a – it's done up a lot of a passion a lot of the time. So you be very proud of yourself. You've been a great uh, uh, addition since the beginning of Canadian MMA, yourself, Faber, and Dylan, and, and a lot of others. So keep it up. Did you say it's not a high paying gig? Wait, are there people getting paid for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's like <laughs> MMA is a promoter, man. It's the same thing, right? Like it's it's yeah. it's not a high paying like promote people who think you're making money and promoting, you're you're sadly mistaken. It's it's yeah. a long grind and it's all of this stuff in combat sport. And that's why again, going back to working together, when you work together, we you know, it's as we all said like I was saying to Sunny, you know, rising tides sail all ships and, and and that's a very important thing that we should all remember. Yeah, for sure. I, I remember when I was writing for Sure Dog all those years ago, it was a great gig, right? I made a, some decent money doing it as just a part-time gig when I was in the military. But once I left Sure Dog and I went out my own, I mean, the only money that, that I see is the money that is coming out of my wallet and going towards yeah. gas to get to Moncton or getting a hotel for a night or, or paying my hosting exactly. fees for, for the internet. So yeah, we, we do this because we love it, not because we want to be super rich. 100%. Same as us, right? And so don't ever think that you're not giving back. You guys are a huge part to this. And, and we as a promotion certainly appreciate what you guys do. So thank you. All right, Derek Clark, I appreciate you. Thank you. And I uh, will talk to you soon.